Thank you for joining us today for Wesley Chapel Online, a weekly worship service brought to you by Late Harvest Wesleyan Ministries in the Dalles, Oregon, USA. Each week Rev. Dr. J. Patrick Bowman shares inspirational music and transformational preaching for your spiritual edification and Christian growth. Now prepare your hearts and minds as we enter the online sanctuary. Good morning, and thank you for joining us at Wesley Chapel Online. Our call to worship this morning is, He Sent His Word. snow come down from the heavens above and they do not return there without doing what they came to do they came to water the earth to make things flourish and grow so the eater can have his bread and the sower will have seed to sow so shall his word be that comes to us from his lips. It cannot return to him without doing what he said it to do. He said his word to heal you, deliver you from your destructions, redeem your life from the pit, and make something wonderful of it. Something wonderful of it. He sent his word to heal you, deliver you from your destructions, redeem your life from the pit, and make something wonderful of it. And make something wonderful of it. Our 
Our opening prayer this morning is adapted from Psalm 4. Answer us when we call, God of our righteousness. You have relieved us in our distress. Be gracious to us and hear our prayer. You sons of man, how long will our honor be treated as an insult? How long will you love what is worthless and strive for a lie? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly person for himself. The Lord hears when we call to him. Tremble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon the bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and trust in the Lord. Many are saying, Who will show us anything good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, Lord. You have put joy in our heart, more than when their grain and new wine are abundant. In peace we will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, have us dwell in safety. Amen. Lord, as we approach your word this morning, 
May our ears be open to hear, our hearts open to respond, and our lives ready to follow your leading. In Jesus' name, Amen. A reading from God's Word, from 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. I solemnly exhort you, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and exhort, with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers, in accordance with their own desires, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But as for you, use self-restraint in all things. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. This ends the reading of God's Word. And God always blesses His Word to those who listen. Good morning. We have talked in previous weeks the ways in which Paul exhibited responsible spiritual parenting. But as Paul begins this final chapter of 2 Timothy, he makes a shift. He wants to tie all the loose ends up. Paul now becomes the Apostle Paul, giving a final apostolic charge to a young pastor in need of instruction. I solemnly exhort you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and exhort with great patience and instruction. The first thing Paul calls Timothy to do is preach the word. That is the content. As we read in Matthew 10, 5 through 8, These twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, saying, Do not go on a road to Gentiles, and do not enter a city of Samaritans but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those with leprosy, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. We notice his instruction was first to preach, then to demonstrate the kingdom of God. There are so many preachers preaching anything but the Bible today that I heard one ex-New Ager say he had trouble finding a church that wasn't promoting things he just got delivered from. The word is not something you receive while channeling some ascended master named Abraham or by befriending an alien from planet Zetox after his flying saucer crashes. The Word is that book you carry to church every Sunday, but never open during the week. If preachers aren't preaching it and you're not reading it, no wonder we are in such a mess. Then Paul tells Timothy, Be ready in season and out of season. That's the context. We will look for an example of in-season in Proverbs 3, 1 through 12. My son, do not forget my teaching, but have your heart comply with my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and a good reputation in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. 
in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his rebuke, for whom the Lord loves he disciplines, just as a father disciplines a son in whom he delights. Proverbs 3, 1 through 12. Well, if that's in season, what's out of season? We'll look at Proverbs 1, 20 through 33. Wisdom shouts in the street. She raises her voice in the public square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates of the city, she declares her saying, How long, you naive ones, will you love simplistic thinking? And how long will scoffers delight themselves in scoffing? And fools hate knowledge. Turn to my rebuke. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand, and no one paid attention, and you neglected all my advice and did not want my rebuke. I will also laugh at your disaster. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm, and your disaster comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They did not accept my advice. They disdainfully rejected every rebuke from me. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own schemes. For the faithlessness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. That again is Proverbs 1, 20 through 33. Number three. Paul tells Timothy to correct, rebuke, and exhort. That's a purpose. All scripture is inspired by God and beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. That was Paul just a chapter ago in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3. We live in a day when correcting, rebuking, and exhorting will at the least get you labeled a hater and at the worst land you in jail. Everything is now off limits. Cancel culture has been effective in creating preachers afraid to preach behind pulpits that are no more than lemonade stands, hawking what goes down easy for people who want the sweet to cover up the sour. Francis Schaeffer once said, Here is the great evangelical disaster. The failure of the evangelical world to stand for truth as truth. There is only one word for this. Accommodation. The evangelical church has accommodated to the world spirit of the age. Truth carries with it confrontation. Truth demands confrontation. Loving confrontation, but confrontation nevertheless. If our reflex action is always accommodation, regardless of the centrality of the truth involved, there is something wrong. Put a hearty amen on that, Francis. Number four, Paul exhorts Timothy to do all this with great patience and instruction. 
And that's our posture. I'll read from Ephesians and then from Titus. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul speaking, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then writing to Titus, he said, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if any man is beyond reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of indecent behavior or rebellion. For the overseer must be beyond reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not overindulging in wine, not a bully, not greedy for money, but hospitable, loving what is good, self-controlled, righteous, holy, disciplined, holding firmly the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict it. For there are many rebellious people, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach, for the sake of dishonest gain. That again is Titus 1, 5 through 11. Now keep in mind here that Paul was not asking Timothy to do something he had not already done himself. General George S. Patton is credited with saying, Do everything you ask of those you command. Patton led his soldiers by example. While he's best known for commanding troops during World War II and perfecting the art of tank warfare, his troops knew he was more than willing to personally get into the fight. During World War I, for example, Patton was shot in the leg while directing tanks after he repeatedly exposed himself to enemy fire. Paul was a veteran of the fight. In our day, he would be covered with purple hearts. All right, we have looked at the content of the charge, the context of the charge, the purpose of the charge, and the posture of the charge. Now let's look at the battle. Verses 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn to myths. According to George Barna, that time has come in America. The latest research, released just the other day, revealed while 69% of American adults identify as Christian, only 6% actually have a biblical world view. Whoa. Too often, says Barna, it seems people who are simply religious, or regular churchgoers, or perhaps people who want a certain reputation or image, embrace the label Christian regardless of their spiritual life and intentions. Christian has become somewhat of a generic term rather than a name that reflects a deep commitment to passionate pursuing and being like Jesus Christ. In his research, Barna categorized people into five groups. Number one, self-identified Christians. Two, self-identified born-again Christians. Three, self-identified evangelical Christians. 4. Theologically born-again Christians, and 5. Integrated Disciples. Of this first group, 
69% of adult Americans, or 176 million people, Barna said, have a number of beliefs consistent with the Bible's teachings, including God created the world and rules over it. God cares about our moral choices, and God gives people unique callings. However, self-identified Christians also have a number of beliefs that are inconsistent with the Bible's teachings. Some of these are that all religions are equal, the Holy Spirit is not a personal being, and people can earn their way to heaven by being good. Beliefs that majorities of people in this category reject include the idea that Jesus is the only person who can save them, that marriage should be between one man and one woman, and that premarital sex is wrong. I don't have time to go over every category here, but let's move on to theologically born-again Christians, or those whose theological positions place them in the born-again category. This category consists of 28% of American adults who are far more likely to rely on Jesus as their only Savior. However, significant percentages of theologically born-again people still hold to unbiblical beliefs. 51% in this group say there is no absolute truth, and 37% say that people can earn their way to heaven by being good enough. So while people who meet the criteria of being born again in their theology are much more likely to hold biblical beliefs, only 19% have a biblical world view. 2,000 years later, we know why Paul told Timothy to preach the word, be ready in season, or when they will listen and respond to biblical truth, and out of season, when they won't listen, and biblical truth is rejected. Correcting, rebuking, and exhorting with the Word of God, patiently instructing. Is it not clear that we have a society wanting to have their ears tickled, accumulating for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, and turning their ears away from the truth they turn aside to miss? And what separates Paul from us? Clayton Craby of ReasonableTheology.org sums it up well. God's people have always had to be vigilant and discerning in order to ensure that they are not being swayed by false teaching. And it would be difficult to say whether or not the problem is worse now than it has been in previous eras of church history. What is decidedly worse, however, is the speed at which false teachers can spread their teaching and the nearly unlimited reach they can have. Thanks to the internet and social media, false teaching is no longer slowed by geographical or cultural restraints. An individual armed with a Twitter account can influence hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, with strange ideas subtle lies, and false doctrines. Media-savvy churches with chart-topping music groups can draw millions towards their errant theology. So what can we do as 21st century Christians, recognizing the battle before us and the obstacles to overcome? Verse 6, But as for you, Paul tells Timothy, use self-restraint in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Let's look at those. Number one, use self-restraint in all things. We must examine our own hearts to be sure we haven't bought into some of the craziness that's out there. There is a smorgasbord of religious ideas at your fingertips. Be careful who you listen to and what you listen to. Check it against the Word. Number two, endure hardship. 
When we begin to question ourselves and question others about the validity of our beliefs, there will be pushback. You may lose friends, you may lose reputation in some circles, you may even be persecuted by some as haters. Remember in those instances what Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says. Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let's run with the endurance, the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number three, do the work of an evangelist. Evangelism is not just preaching behind a pulpit or on a street corner. Evangelism is loving people because they are people and waiting for an opportunity to share your faith. That can happen over coffee, over pizza, over a walk in the park with your dogs. It's called friendship evangelism, and it's effective. Number four, fulfill your ministry. God has called each one of us to a unique and glorious ministry. Quit comparing yourself to someone else and faithfully run your own race. If you stay in your own lane, you will reach the finish line a winner. Lord, help us apply this word to our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen.
As we finish this service this morning, please receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my Redeemer, my stronghold, who trains my hands for battle and my feet. of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Lord my Thank you for joining us today. You can find out more about us at lateharvestwesleyan.org. Again, our website is lateharvestwesleyan.org. Have a wonderful week, and God bless. <laughs>